So good morning all and welcome to this morning's webinar. Um, this morning we are looking at research findings from leather jackets in grassland. My name is Niall Lynch. I'm based in the Chagas office in Kilrush and I'm joined by my colleague Michael O'Connor and Michael is a dairy advisor within the region as well. So Michael will be giving us a hand on the Q&A later on in the session. Um, just for your information, this morning's um, webinar is being recorded, so all the PowerPoint presentations and everything will be recorded on it. And also, there's a big function for a lot of you that will be handy down the bottom is the Q&A. So if you just want, if you have any questions or anything, you just click on the Q&A tab and them questions will come into us. And Michael will be putting them to our speakers later on in the, in the session. Um, so research on this area, I would want to line out at the start is is kind of in its infancy in the Republic of Ireland. With um, our first guest joining us today, Ashling Moffat, um, completed the first uh, PhD on this and research in Republic of Ireland, and has covered a lot of the West Clare area. So a lot of you might have already met her. Um, so it's there now. What we'd say is there's no silver bullet or or answers straight away to to, to looking at. Um, how to control leather jackets. But what we would say is that, look, there's no silver bullet on it, but what we'll do is look at the research that's there at the moment and try and use that as the, to the best of our ability to curb the population of leather jacket and how it's affecting our grassland there. So today we're joined by, uh, and greatly great to have him, is uh, Dr. Ashling Moffat, who's a postdoctoral researcher in UCD, and Ashling will be discussing leather jackets in Irish agricultural systems, um, what we know and future ideas. And then after Ashling, we are joined by Dr. Archie Murchie, Head of Pest and Pathogen Surveillance in AFBI, and Archie will be discussing integrated pest management approaches to leather jacket mitigation in County Fermanagh. So, um, I'd like to welcome you both, and if Ashling, if you want to to work away there and start Perfect. on your presentation, thank you. Thanks so much, Niall, for the introduction. Um, I was just saying to the guys, unfortunately, I'm just worried about my Wi-Fi, so I'll, I'll turn the camera off once I share the screen. Um, but I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to share my initial findings from the PhD. So I'll get started there. So. Yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about my PhD research, especially as there'll be some farmers here today who kindly let me sample their fields in Clare. And I want to discuss the leather jackets in Irish agricultural systems, specifically going into detail about what we know from previous studies, their life cycle, and then wrapping this into an Irish context. So what my research looked at and some of the findings and as Niall said, this is the first research conducted in the Republic of Ireland. So you can take the results as preliminary. And we took an overall view of the problem and now can further suggest areas to target with additional research. So I said, we'll start off with some basics. So we're all aware leather jackets are pests in agricultural settings, especially in grasslands and in spring cereals. And what some, some of us might not know is that they're the larvae of this adult species here on the left, um, a crane fly or daddy long legs, which are often seen flying in late July to er early August. And one female adult can lay over 300 eggs. So they do have the potential to build up into high leather jacket populations over time. And the larvae themselves feed on the root and shoots of crops and they leave bare patches throughout the ground. So like this picture here given by a farmer in County Clare. And the issues here were particularly bad. You can see a lot of bare patches um, from where the larvae had eaten away the crop. And then seagulls actually were coming in and ripping up sods of turf. So there is massive issues in Ireland going on at the minute and we need to come together and think about what we can do about these. So to summarize what we already know, Within the UK and Northern Ireland, there were surveys conducted all throughout the 1970s up to the 1990s. And what they found was that in grasslands, total sword destruction uh, occurred at 4.9 million larvae per hectare, which is quite high. Other observations that they made was that shallow rooting and heavy applications of slurry led to plant stress and increased damage conducted by leather jackets. 
wet and waterlogged soils were where larvae thrived and were in their optimum setting. And problems, as we saw in Clare, were often exacerbated by birds, so predation from seagulls or starlings on inland, inland farms. And we know that ploughing the soil and cultivating it can reduce larval populations by up to 50%. So this is optimum um, effective control measure, but often cannot be done within grassland settings. So there have been economic thresholds set by previous researchers and economic thresholds are defined by the pest population level where the damage expected is equal to that cost of control measures needed. And while these are outdated, so the last economic thresholds were set in 1984 and 1994, they were set at 1 million larvae per hectare for grasslands and about 600,000 larvae per hectare for cereals. But they were based on the control measures available at that time. So chlorpyrifos, which was a broad spectrum insecticide, and nitrogen fertilizer. And while we compare this to the availability today, chlorpyrifos has been prohibited in the EU and is no longer available for agricultural use, um, just due to uh, health and hazard risks for the applicator. And the price of fertilizer is, is exponentially increasing year on year. So in Ireland alone, prices have increased over 149% in 2021. So these costs, uh, associated with yield loss and control will vary, but the thresholds remain static, so they're quite out of date at the minute and will need to be reproduced for current dates 2023. So when it comes to species of leather jacket, knowing the difference is really important as life cycles and feeding behaviour and damage stages differ between the two. So there are two common ones within agricultural systems which not many people know about. The first being Tipula pallidosa, which is on the screen at the minute. And they have eggs which hatch in August and larvae are living and feeding in the soil for up to 11 months. So it's a long soil life cycle and plenty of opportunity for damage within the crop. They're most active in spring. So they feed um, in the April and May months and then begin to pupate later in July when they slow down their, their damage period. And adults emerge back then in August. When we compare this to the second species, Tipola oleraceae, they have two life cycles per year, the first being in September and October, which feed until May, and then they pupate again. So this is important to know the difference between which species you're dealing with when it comes to timing of applications, because you always want to target that first instar larval, so the most juvenile stage, because they're most vulnerable. So with Tipula pallidosa, this would be one application in August, but for Tipula oleraceae, this would be two, one in September, October, and one at the end of summer. So the first things first for any IPM directive is to know the biological life cycle and target it as specifically as possible. So in the next few slides, I just wanted to show you what my thought process was behind the PhD. We wanted to take a holistic or well-rounded view of leather jackets as a pest species. So the first things first is that we know that there's soil dwelling. We need to think about that soil environment, what populations they're occurring at. If it's high population in one field, why is it high and not in another? And then what specific species are we dealing with, which is important for any IPM decision. From there, we need to look at the crop type and take into account what farm is occurring on the land, what's growing in the soil, what are the leather jackets eating, what root systems do they like, and are any specific crops vulnerable? Then what's happening at farm scale? What sort of system is it? Is it suckler, dry stock? Is it sheep? Is it organic? What about soil health? What nutrients are available? What are restricted? What are low? What needs to be included? And from a farm management perspective, what decisions are being taken that could impact the soil or this pest habitat? Is the farmer reseeding? Is he ploughing? Is there fertiliser or insecticide being applied? What's going on at that farm management level? And then finally, what role does the weather play on this? So the climate and how will climate change impact this going forward in the next few years? So all of this brainstorming led me to the following areas to look at. So first, the populations in Ireland and the species that are occurring. So I conducted a national survey of the Republic of Ireland. Um, we then looked at land use and soil properties. 
which turned into an overall soil health view. And I'll show you then what we found from looking at climate and farm management perspective. So we'll start off with the leather jacket population. So my national survey took place in 2019 and 2021 because we wanted to determine the populations occurring across the Republic of Ireland and to identify that species of agronic, uh, agronomic importance. So this map shows the populations that I found in grasslands all across Ireland where the units were in million per hectare. So we can see that there were quite a few, a few above that one million per hectare threshold that we indicated earlier. And those would be yellow in colour and the rest, anything higher than that goes orange and red. So in 2019, I actually linked up with an advisor in Clare, Tom Gleeson, and we sampled a subset of farms in Kilkee where there was terrible issues with leather jackets and really high infestations. So you can see all along the West Coast, there was quite some issues, which drove up that average population of 887,000 in 2019. But then in 2021, when I included more inland farms, that brought down the average somewhat and we weren't seeing as many issues in the middle of Ireland. And I included this cereals um, map here just as a contrast because we, so, we can see that besides the two outliers in the map that are in red and yellow, that most of the populations were below the, the cereal threshold. Um, our one outlier of 800,000 per hectare was in red and it was an oilseed rape field, a crop notorious for trapping crane fly adults in its canopy. But 3.3% of the fields were above while the rest were below this threshold. So it just shows what an issue we're having in grasslands compared to cereals. And this is more than likely due to the incorporation of ploughing and soil cultivation from a cereal perspective. So when it came to leather jacket species, uh, visual identification is quite tricky and it's hard to do when you pick up a leather jacket in field. So I would have visually identified them under the microscope in total 619 larvae. And because it's subjective to each person, I also sent a subsample for DNA barcoding, which is a molecular technique just to justify my answers and to make sure I was being accurate. And we were seeing that in Ireland, over 70% of the samples across the grassland and cereal sites that I sampled were Tipula pallidosa, which is that one life cycle per species um, pest. So that indicates what we need to target more so. However, this 70% was lower compared to the UK. In Scotland, they're seeing around 90% Tipula pallidosa, which might indicate we have more um, we have more of an issue with Tipilolaraceae coming in, which we'll need to keep an eye on, which could be seen in more of a cereals perspective. So for grassland, you can take it that it's more than likely Tipilopallidose you're dealing with. But this is quite important from a life cycle perspective and targeting the IPM um, control measures. So our takeaways from the survey were that grasslands were more vulnerable to high intensity pest attacks. This is because populations can build up over time in undisturbed uh, land and in soil, whereas cereal fields incorporated cultivation and different crops had different um, vulnerabilities. And the highest populations in Ireland were seen even when compared to historic surveys across Ireland. So it's becoming more of an issue and without a control option such as chloropyrifos, it will just continue to become um, high populations across the country. So an effective measure is needed. So from a soil perspective, I took an overall look at all the soil elements from major to micro. And this is important to do because there's a collinear relationship between all the soil properties, meaning that they all influence each other. And I took a subsample from each field that I sampled and I submitted it for ICP spectrometry analysis with Chagas Johnstown Castle. So it's similar to sending in your soil tests uh, at field level when you do that at, on your farm. And the elements that were correlated with leather jacket populations were manganese, iron, aluminium, potassium, sodium and zinc. So now it's hard to dis disentangle each element and if there's a direct effect on or from larvae. As I said, soil elements are intrinsically linked and things like overall pH and organic matter and soil conditions in general need to be taken into account. 
But if I can draw your attention to the top two lines here, these were the elements that were significantly correlated with leather jacket counts in Irish grasslands. And I think we can explain these um, quite well. So we see a significantly positive correlation with sodium and larval populations. And this means that where sodium concentrations were high in soils, so were larval populations. So now we don't assume causation or that larvae are attracted to salty soils. This simply implies coexistence or that both were coincidentally occurring together at the same time. And that would make sense because we saw the highest larval populations on the west coast. And that's likely due to ocean spray drift um, or proximity to the sea. With our second element, iron, we see the opposite relationship. So we see a significantly negative correlation with leather jacket populations, meaning where larval populations were high, iron levels were low in the soil. So this is a common occurrence in any waterlogged soil as iron can become soluble and is taken up by the plant. So these two elements are in fact, uh, and in fact the rest of the list below, while they're not directly answering our question of what factors are affecting leather jackets from a soil perspective, they're instead suggesting that overall soil health is vitally important. And as you can see, a lot of elements are linked with soil pH and organic matter. So when I look directly at pH of the 135 35 fields sampled in Ireland, we had a range of 4.8 to 7.6, so quite a, a wide range. And what we were seeing as a trend was that the highest larval po populations were seen in more acidic soils, um, with the optimum seeming to be between 5.5 to 6. Um, so it, it's showing the importance of pH, which I believe Archie will go into further in his own talk. So that brings us to soil health. And to further look into the overall soil habitat for these grubs, I wanted to see the overall abundances of bacteria and fungi in the soils and if larval presence or population had an effect on them or vice versa. So for this, I took a subsample from each field and I conducted DNA extraction and sequencing to get a full picture of microbial communities at field scale. And what came back was quite interesting and it further reinforced some of our own ideas. What we saw was that in both the fungal and bacterial communities, we were getting significantly more abundant good microbes in the field where there were no larvae. So this included plant growth promoting or PGP families that are beneficial to crop yield. And then in stark contrast here on the right, on sites where leather jacket populations were high and above that grassland threshold, in bacterial communities, we were seeing significantly more abundance of families like this one, Anorelacinae, and they thrive in anaerobic conditions, so where soils with low levels of oxygen. So this highlights once again the, impa the impact of water logging. And when we brought out soil chemistry back into play here, we saw that the correlations between the microbial communities and the same soil chemical elements from the leather jackets further signify that the larger picture of soil health and soil condition is in play. So this brings me on to climate and overall farm management. So my research was partnered with SRUC, which is the Scottish Agricultural College, and I was lucky enough to get access to their data, and they've been conducting annual leather jacket surveys since the 60, 60s, 1960s, all the way up to 2018. So I got access to their field management records of all their grassland sites. And some variables include whether the farmer used fertilizer that year, used pesticide. They consider the age of the field or when the field was last plowed, the livestock type, etc. Um, and I looked at the abiotic effect. So this ties in climate, such as temperature and precipitation. And I grouped the variables to see if there was a farm management effect. So I'll go into those results now. So for the climate perspective, we can see here that there's a group of farms mapped across a 10 year period um, and three fields per farm were sampled. So you can see that with the different lines that are going on. And the shadowing I have included on the map, the red and the blue, that indicates two notice noticeable um, population effects that were going on that were consistent across all farms. So in 2013, 2014, you can see on each field and each farm, there was a sharp increase in leather jacket populations 
followed next year in the blue graph or the blue shading that there's a significant drop off. So this happens due to um, this drop off happened due to a mild autumn winter in 2013, 2014. So you're seeing a lag effect of the population. If you have quite um, mild weather when the larval are hatching and turning into larval in star one and in star two, so that first vulnerable stage, they tend to do quite well. Um, but if there's any sort of heat uh, during that period, it drops off the next year. So you'll see a decline. So what we're seeing here was that it was a hot um, autumn winter, which resulted in the population declining in the next year. And from a farm management perspective, I included all variables in a linear mixed effect model where the random variable was the farm. And what we saw was that there was a negative, significant negative correlation with field size and leather jacket population, meaning that as field size increased, so larger field sizes, we saw lesser leather jackets in it. Um, and this might make sense from a life cycle perspective, as if you think of crane fly adults, you often see them in small fields. Um, they kind of flock to the boundaries or to the hedgerows for protection. Um, so this might be more of a life cycle perspective, but to, to consider this further, further research would be needed. We also saw a negative correlation um, between sheep grazing and leather jacket population versus no grazing. So this actually backs up anecdotal evidence from our farmers in, in Scotland, where they said when they had sheep grazing, they had fewer leather jacket problems. And this, along with the, the next point, cuts into the height of sward at, at significant life cycle stages. So with sheep grazing, you're getting a tighter sward, so shorter grass, and this will be beneficial to you as a farmer because leather jacket adults need long grass to um, cling on to, relay their eggs, and it benefits them in the long term. The same can be said about the five cuts of silage versus no silage. If a farmer is taking many silage cuts, that means they'll have long grass at key stages of the life cycle, which is what you don't want when you have adults coming out. Um, and then finally, the use of pesticides obviously was negative against leather jackets. Um, and this was left in as kind of a justification for the linear model. Unfortunately, as I said, chloropyrifos is not available for farmers anymore. And then when we group the variables into intensity factor, purely as a model for an academic exercise, um, the intensity was reflected on the variables we had within the data set. So for example, we labeled permanent pastures as low intensity compared to fields that had been reseeded within the last five years. And those without grazing were, was low intensity versus uh, a grazing system of both cattle and sheep. And when we use this uh, management intensity index score from Anair et al, we could see that we had significantly higher leather jacket populations in those low intensity farms um, compared to the high intensity farms. So as uh, academic exercise, this is quite interesting because it kind of reinforced that ploughing helps to reduce populations as well as having um, short swords. And then this brings me on to my favourite chapter from my research, which was an experiment created especially for the grassland farmers that I saw had major issues because we could see from my results it was the grassland farmers that were vulnerable, specifically in the West, uh, where the infestations were higher. So we need something to combat this yield loss and reseeding failure that we're seeing on these grassland sites. And we need something that's alternative and sustainable going forward. So I looked into more practical IPM approaches for these farmers that could be readily implemented. And I conducted a feeding experiment using plant monocultures and multi-species swords. And the plants involved were perennial ryegrass and timothy, which are two grasses, plantain and chicory, which are two herbs, white clover and red clover, which are two legumes, and then all six were included in the multi-species mix. There were two treatments, so pots received leather jackets and pots that did not, and larvae were added to the treated pots at larval instar one stage in August, and then left to fully develop throughout their whole life cycle until May. And at May, I destructively harvested um, each pot to compare the feeding effect of the larvae on each plant type, to compare the root and shoot weights 
which relates to yields on, on a farm scale um, of the plants in both treatment. So this experiment was repeated three times with hand-sewn swords and then finally using cores from pre-established sword trials. And I'll present some of the results here. So first looking at the root yield results. In this particular experiment, there was no significant results, but you can see that white clover in was reduced. Um, so the purple indicates the treatments that had no larvae and the yellow indic in indicates the larvae treated plants. So you can see that there is no significance, but the trends were declining overall. And for the shoot yields, Again, you can see a massive drop off in white clover um, from feeding. And this kind of back up, backs up previous literature results on where we know that leather jackets feed actively on white clover once in a sword. But what was interesting is that the multi-species remain stable, both in shoot and root yields. And I made a quick grassland summary slide just to summarize the whole three experiments. So across the board, we were seeing highest larval retrieval in red clover and plantain pots, the monocultures. The larval weights were always heaviest in, what, in red clover, so they were most well-fed there. And then root weights had a consistent decrease in the perennial ryegrass, red clover and white clover, and always a root increase due to herbivory and multi-species sward. So that shows that when you incorporate multiple plant types, they can compensate yield loss through different uh, coping mechanisms compared to just one monoculture. And the shoot weight was seen um, a consistent, consistent decrease across red clover and white clover, and significantly so in white clover fresh weights across the board in all three experiments. And this is important for farmers to take into consideration as in it, across Ireland in the grassland systems, white clover has been um, beneficial to incorporate into perennial ryegrass swords. But if you're incorporating this alone, the additional benefits um, of including it could be taken away if leather jacket infestations are quite high. So to summarize that research, it was the first study uh, to look at the feeding behavior across the full larval life cycle. So we were seeing the damage it can, it can fully inflict. And it suggests that diverse swords have increased tolerance um, because there's compensatory factors going on behind the scenes. So this research adds to multiple other benefits of including multi-species swords, which, which include less nitrogen inputs, increased milk and meat yields, and then higher tolerances, um, such as stress uh, related. So say each plant has different rooting systems, could, could tolerate more um, waterlogged soils, for example. And overall, including more diverse swords promotes biodiversity in the long run. So there's multiple benefits to the multi-species swords. So some take home points to summarize the full presentation. When we bring back the key, key seven points that I mentioned at the start, we can see that our leather jacket populations in Ireland were higher than any previous UK surveys and might continue to get worse if there's no effective control measure taken in. And the West of Ireland was um, particularly vulnerable. Our major species of importance is Tipula pallidosa across the board, but there is um, a possibility of seeing more Tipula oleracea specifically with um, climate change occurring. Grasslands are more affected uh, and more vulnerable because cereals incorporate ploughing and crop rotation. So ploughing we know reduces populations by 50% and crop rotation, certain crops are more vulnerable such as oilseed rape. From the soil properties, we see that it, there's an indication of more an overall soil health issue, which ties in with farm management and things conducted at farm scale. And mild conditions at larval instar one and pupation, so which would be around the July time, these are favourable. Um, and with climate change going forward, we might see a higher increase of leather jacket populations if, if this is the case. And a short sward height might help in the summer and autumn time because adults need long grass to hold on to to lay their eggs. So keeping the short the sward tight might be of benefit to the farmer. And it's important to take note of field size and surroundings and consider the life cycle of the pest when going forward with any control measures. 
Um, overall, there's possible soil health associations. So doing your soil test regularly um, would be of benefit. And from my research, it seems that diverse wards seem to tolerate larval feeding um, more so than any monoculture system. So with that, I'll say thank you. Special thanks to the 135 farmers that let me sample their fields all across Ireland. Um, special thanks also to the Danube farming group, such as Dave Beecher, which I had some um, farm sites in the survey, and especially to Tom Gleason and the other Chagas advisors who um, provided me with farm contacts for my survey. And if anyone wants to contact me further, my, I left my personal email address um, for any further questions or if you want any results from certain fields that I may have sampled, you're more than welcome to get in touch. So I'll hand over to Archie now. Thanks very much for that, Ashling. Um, just a reminder for everyone on the call that the Q and A um function is down the bottom as well. So if you do have any questions, to put them in there, and we'll be putting them questions to Ashling and Archie at the at the end of our session. So next up, we have Dr. Archie Murchie. Thank you, and if they can hear me, okay. So thanks to Ashling for fantastic talk and going into a lot of detail on our studies. Um, uh, and thank you also to Chuggis for the invite. Um, I'm I'm got a slightly uh, different approach. We've got a smaller project, which is is really an overview of um, pest management approaches to leather jackets and for mana. Um, I, I'll. Do my acknowledgements at the start. Really, this is a an EIP Agri project. Um, so it's a, a European Innovation Partnership project, and we're working really with four farmers. Um, the project is managed by AgriSearch, and um, I, I say I'm based in the Agri Food and Biosciences Institute. Um, so I, I, my co-conspirators in this this talk are Stephen Jess, who should be online, and, and Gillian Hoy as well and also Florentine Spans, uh, who's currently overseas. So um, I just can continue on. I hope that noise in the background doesn't distract too much. Um, but really, uh, I'll reiterate really what, what Ashling said. Um, there are two species of concern, Tipula pallidosa, um, which is the, the one we have most problems with. Um, and it's uh, on the wing as an adult crane fly in August, September, and then Tipula oloracea, um, which is more of a problem really in, in cereals in Northern Ireland. And um, I, it's on the wing at the moment. So I, I caught a specimen um, a couple of days ago. Um, the way you can distinguish between them um, is the, really the length of the abdomen in respect of a wing length. Uh, so tipula pallidosa abdomen here is longer than the wing, and, and tipula oloracea, um, the abdomen is shorter than the wing. Um, so uh, uh, you can see that um, just by eye. Um, the other thing I should say just about um, the, 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 the crane flies is you'll notice that the, the female has a very pointed sort of spear-like abdomen, and that's to lay its eggs, and then the male has a clasper, so you can tell between the sexes quite easily as well. Um, life cycle, I say, uh, Ashling's really covered. Um, key point, really, just to, to reiterate, is that they spend most of their life cycle in the soil, and the adult crane flies are only really um, say on the wing in August, September for, for Tipula pallidosa, and then we have two separate uh, emergencies uh, for Tipula oloracea. Uh, so leather da jacket damage to grassland, so um, both reseeds and permanent grassland are affected, and you can sort of see the, the, the damage in some of these slides here, uh, and Ashling has, has shown this as well. So you see this uh, patchy appearance, the yellowing of the grass, um, you can see often where birds are feeding. Um, so these are holes or where the birds are, are chasing after the leather jackets. And in average, uh, I say in Northern Ireland, we're, we're looking at yield losses of about half a tonne dry matter per hectare. And that is uh, coming from a population of, of around about 0.5 million per hectare. Um, so this is where we, we, we start to see uh, an impact on um, yield. So just to, to go into this in a bit more detail, um, 
this is just a table uh, showing that the, the cost of the impact, uh, and these are these are figures that are really extrapolated uh, from it, some experimental work looking at how much um, dry matter uh, the leather jackets consume. So if we take a, a typical population here, um, which would be about half a million per hectare, it, it's causing half a ton uh, dry matter loss with about 90 euros of damage. So that would be a, a typical damage you'd be getting in leather jackets. And we can relate this back to, to what we would find in our sampling. Uh, and I'll come on to talk about this uh, a little bit later. Um, but then if we look at the, the economic threshold, uh, Ashling's already said that economic thresholds should fluctuate. They should be responsive to control measures, value of the crop, cost of fertilizer, et cetera. Um, but they tend to be fixed. Um, but we can, we can look at some of the costs here um, of the economic threshold. So about a million leather jackets per hectare cause just over a ton loss in dry matter, um, which is at a cost of about 180 euros. So we can sort of factor these um, sort of economics into some of our decision making. Uh, the previous control measure was chlorpyrifos, um, which was, was typically sold as Dursban. Uh, and this was withdrawn in 2016. Uh, now, the reason Dursban or sorry, chlorpyrifos uh, as the active ingredient was withdrawn was to do with operator safety. Now, I, I know speaking to some of the farmers, they might say, you know, like uh, with various changes, could we get Dursban back? And I, I think it's important to just say why uh, the insecticide was removed. And it was because of genotoxic effects. Um, so these are changes in the chromosomes and DNA, um, which are initiating events to, to influence leukemia. And then there was also uh, evidence of neurological effects on um, uh, newborn uh, and sort of uh, embryonic development. And importantly, this was supported by epidemiological data. So real, real world findings suggesting um, that this insecticide could, could have a, a, an impact on the unborn child. So, so that's why the insecticide uh, was removed. And the other issue, it, I should say, it wasn't removed for environmental reasons, it was removed for health reasons, but it, but it is a broad spectrum insecticide as well. So there, there are environmental impacts of, of spraying this um, broadly um, on the environment. Uh, it's not specific to just one the pest. Uh, so the project we have, I say, was a bit of an overview project. Um, so we're looking at the leather jacket problem within Fermanagh. Um, we're trying to tease out some of the factors that influence our prevalence. And then th the bulk of the project ha has been a, a bit of a, a gathering of data, um, not so much uh, experimental work, but just trying to get a feel for what the options are as part of an integrated pest management strategy. Uh, and the ultimate aim of this is, is of course, to, to aid in decision-making on the farm and to prevent leather jacket losses. So uh, just to go over what integrated pest management is, um, it, it's really a case of stopping reliance on a, a chemical insecticide and using a variety of techniques to manage the pests and to reduce pest population levels to, to below economic thresholds. Um, it's actually in law now. It's part of the Sustainable Use Directive uh, that came in from the EU. And it, it's widely used in protected crops. And uh, that's, that's not done for any particular environmental reason in protected crops, uh, but it, it, it's occurred because they, they can have huge problems with insecticide resistance in protected crops. So they have to use a multifaceted approach, a variety of techniques. Um, to manage um, pests. And, you know, the techniques we're talking about here is, is starting at the very start using cultural control, biological control, chemical control, very targeted, uh, but a whole range of other things that, that really fit into the package of, of good crop agronomy. So just to get back um, to what we, we did in Fermanagh, um, we did some soil sampling. This is the way we would look for leather jackets uh, traditionally. Uh, we'd take a, a soil core. Um, we, we were working on four farms uh, and we, we, we approached, um, sorry, five fields for farms. So that's 20 fields in total. Um, 
we, we sampled in March uh, because we were we're trying to assess really the leather jacket populations, and that's the time when they're the largest and, and most detectable. If you're looking at, at control measures, you'll try and sample earlier in the year so you could apply a control measure um, before the damage is done. Uh, so the traditional means of, of uh, monitoring leather jackets is to take these soil cores, um, wash them through in water, and then float off the leather jackets in a salt solution. Uh, and this is what we did here. And you can just see the leather jackets appearing. Uh, and Ashling ha has already uh, mentioned that the method of identification between is looking basically at the leather jackets rear end. Um, so these are the, the anal spiracles and the anal papillae, and the shape of these can distinguish uh, between the two species uh, we're looking for. The other method, and in fact, uh, the method that is more convenient is to, to sample in the field. Um, so uh, we put in these pipes and just push them into the soil and fill them with salt water. So this is saturated salt solution. And again, it has a similar effect that it, it agitates the leather jackets and they wriggle and sort of come to the surface and float in this saturated salt solution. And they can be counted uh, directly in the field. So it's a, a lot quicker method to use. Uh, and when we assessed it against soil coring, uh, we found it was about between 80 to 90% as efficient uh, as the detailed soil coring, but it, it saves an awful lot of work and cost. Um, so we, we would recommend for our own particular uses that we, we just stick with the, the, the brine uh, tubes. Uh, just some of the results on the farms in Fermanagh. Um, so this was the first year um, we looked at a random selecting of fields. And this is the number of leather jackets uh, per hectare up the y-axis and just the, the fields along um, the farmers, sorry, in the different cars, and then the individual fields uh, in the numbers along um, the x-axis. Uh, and this is the, the point, the red line is where we're, we're looking at yield loss. So showing that, the, you know, that most farms were, were having, um, you know, slight problems with, with leather jackets in this case. Uh, but there were the occasional farmer who, who was getting really way above the, the economic threshold uh, of about 4 million um, per, per, per hectare. And that's really where the, the sward uh, is at risk, uh, as Ashling uh, mentioned. Um, the, the second year, um, we, we sampled 31 fields. And again, it's a similar pattern um, of numbers above what would be uh, the, the threshold where I, I, you know, it would be economically worthwhile to really uh, tackle this problem. So uh, about seven fields, 23% were above a million leather jackets per hectare, and about 50% uh, were above um, the 500,000 level mark where, where you start to see damage. And the, the highest uh, level of infestation were field with an estimated 4.5 million uh, leather jackets per hectare. Uh, and if you remember back um, to some of the economic um, e estimates, um, this field is really needs something done to it um, because the leather jackets are, are just just eating it, eating it, eating it out. Um, so, I mean, what can be apparent is that adjacent fields can have quite different uh, numbers of leather jackets. I mean, there's a, a four foot fold difference between these two fields that are right next to each other. In fact, the, the photographs are, are taken in the gateway, uh, looking in, in both directions. Um, so this field here, you can see the damage, um, you can see the rushes, um, and you can see where the leather jackets are, are really eating away at the sward. Um, this other field is much greener, much healthier. Still got a fair number of leather jackets, um, but much lower than its neighboring field. And um, Speaking to the, the farmer in this case, uh, they said that the, the difference really was that this was treated with rush control. So getting a bit more care and uh, perhaps, um, you know, the effect of, of, of having the herbicide treatment did, did have an effect. And I'll mention this later uh, when I come on to talk about uh, the actual steps. So um, the idea of what we are doing is, is trying to get together all the different measures that can mitigate against leather jacket damage into an integrated pest management 
uh, package. So um, what Niall said at the beginning uh, is there's no silver bullet. Um, we're not going to replace chlorpyrifos uh, anytime soon. Um, although saying that, if you look down at the red here, if you can see my cursor moving, um, there are some insecticides that are approved uh, for golf courses, uh, fairways, race courses, etc. Um, but they're not currently approved um, for grassland. Excuse me. And the, the idea between um, integrated pest management is that each stage sort of chips away at the leather jacket population. So you're not going to get any one thing is going to give control, but maybe getting a 5% control here, a 10% control here, you can build up a management package. And, and these measures are all really good agronomy and maintaining soil health. So they're good things to do anyway. And what we've done is sort of divide this into a long-term approach. So things like drainage, reseeding, constant monitoring, uh, a medium season approach. So maybe every two or three seasons, look at liming, uh, look at maybe establishing a break crop, and then short term things that can be done within the season. So if I just look at this in a bit more detail, uh, long term, um, we, we, drainage would seem to be uh, beneficial because the family, the Tupulidae, uh, which the, the crane flies, leather jackets belong to, is effectively a, an aquatic or semi-aquatic family. A lot of the species are related to, to, to water. And so the damp of the soil suits leather jackets. Uh, and I say it's been pointed out by Ashling, it's been pointed out in Scotland that water logging was a factor contributing to leather jacket prevalence. And we have good anecdotal evidence from the farmers that we're dealing with that well-drained fields have fewer leather jacket problems. Uh, reseeding, um, so the, the, the sort of rule of thumb is in, a, in an intensive production is to reseed when the proportion of sown species is less than 50% in the sward. And then following the sort of soil cultivation uh, and reseeding, it, the leather jacket populations can take about seven to 10 years to recover. And so if you're reseeding every 10 years, this in itself should be uh, aid to, to maintain leather jacket populations at low levels. Um, we were discussing this earlier, and, and one of the problems is that you need to have some method of cultivating the soil. Um, reseeding works um, because the leather jackets are physically damaged, they're exposed to predation, and also there might be a period um, when they don't, they can't feed. The, the, there's no food source for them. So um, there might be a problem with direct drilling or minimum tilled reseeds um, because the, the larvae are not killed. Um, so that, that's something just to bear in mind and to consider um, going ahead. On-farm monitoring is something we would, would certainly encourage. And you can use the, the brine tubes are very simple to make up. And I say it's just saturated table salt solutions. Um, or alternatively, um, you know, dig up turf with a spade and sort through them by hand. Uh, but I think the, the thing that's important is to try and keep a consistent uh, method that you can use and you can relate between fields uh, from year to year. And the idea be, be to, behind this is to identify problem fields in advance um, so you don't suddenly end up uh, with a problem. You know, you can see the leather jacket po uh, populations building uh, and so once they're getting to, you know, that that sort of, you know, uh, five or six level in the brine cores, but per time, 10 um, brine tubes, then, you know, start to, to think about maybe doing something about it. Um, the other the other thing that we were looking at uh, in this project was the use of forecasting models. And this is because uh, leather jackets populations do vary from year to year. Uh, and a lot of this uh, is driven by weather conditions. Um, so mild winters, wet autumns would seem to favor uh, leather jacket population buildup. Um, so this is something that was done back in really the, the, the early 1990s, late 1980s. And it's something that perhaps should be re revisited again. Um, just some very rough findings. I see that these are not scientific findings. Um, but just to show that, you know, that leather jacket uh, populations will build up in fields. Um, so 
you know, an indicator of whether there's going to be a problem in the future is when you have leather jackets in the past. Uh, this is what this graph indicates here. And then just about the value of reseeding. So we asked some of the farmers we're working with when they had reseeded, and, and we can see a little bit of a drop here um, between the, the fields that were reseeded after 2010 um, compared to those that, that weren't reseeded. So uh, I say it's not scientific, um, it's not statistically valid, but there is an indication just from the, the small data set we have of the value of reseeding. Looking at, at the, the medium term approaches, um, we, we've talked about things like pH, uh, and Ashling's mentioned that, and I'll, I'll come on to it a little bit later as well. Multi-species swords um, have, have great benefits if they can, if the agronomy and the, the soil conditions and the weather conditions suit. And then establishing a brassica break crop and maybe the use of natural enemies. The, these um, things, um, the boxes here that have um, a question mark are, are things that we, we, we really don't know. Uh, there's very little research on, on how to manage these. So um, just to talk about liming, um, this is a, a small data set, um, just looking at the effect of, of pH on leather jacket count per, per field. Um, and, and just uh, say reiterating what, what Ashling said, is that we do tend to find more leather jacket problems in the, the, the more acidic fields. Um, so, so liming should promote good grass growth and should have an impact on the leather jacket populations. But uh, as Ashling said, it is a complex interaction. Um, you know, there's soil organic matter, soil moisture, micronutrient availability, plant health and pH. They're, they're, they're not... Um, just one thing, they're interacting with each other. Uh, Multi-species swords, uh, Ashling has uh, already covered that uh, and the potential benefits um, in terms of uh, how the leather jackets um, basically feed on, on the different plant species uh, in the multi-species sword. And then uh, a brassica break crop is something to consider. Um, this is slightly complex in the sense that all seed rape um, or cereals following oilseed rape can have significant problems with tipula oleracea, um, but this seems to do with the the the, the very dense canopy that oilseed rape has, and, and maybe some of the the residues can into the soil. Um, a a, a brassica break crop could be useful because it's not a preferred host plant. Uh, for leather jackets. Brassicas uh, release defense compounds and these tend to um, prohibit feeding. So, uh, you know, you can taste them themselves, you know, that's that sulfury um, mustard taste that you get of, you know, brassicas, you know, like cabbages and things like that is actually a defense compound uh, against insect herbivory. So building in a, a crop rotation with a brassica break crop should um, limit leather jacket populations. Um, but I say this, this is an area that probably needs a bit more work. And then biological control by natural enemy. Um, so leather jackets are predated uh, by birds, rooks and starlings. And just in this left picture here, you can see the leather jackets just in the little container and where the birds have been feeding. Um, so the birds have really indicated that there's a leather jacket population there. Um, there's always a level of natural control in the environment and the crop. So leather jacket populations get attacked by viruses, they get attacked by bacteria, they get attacked by fungi. Uh, and there are some moves to use some of these um, sort of biopesticides as control measures. And, and I, I'll speak about this later. And then there's, there's things like parasitic wasps. Um, so these are minute little insects, some of the smallest insects known. And what they do, this species here, this is a, a, an electron micrograph just showing this anaphy species. Uh, but they actually lay their own eggs in the leather jacket eggs. So it, this gives an idea just how small these little wasps are. And my predecessor, Rod Blackshaw, um, uh, he had a student looking at this. And what they found is that 44% of the leather of the tipulid eggs, which will become leather jackets, um, were attacked by these little 
uh, parasitic wasps. Now, that's that's a huge number. Now, we know very little about that. We don't even know what this species is. Um, but, you know, what, what impact is that having on the population? Uh, are the number of eggs laid um, by the crane fly just so vast um, that this really has, is having a minimal effect on, on the population? Or could it actually be reducing the leather jacket population by 44%? Uh, we, we, we just don't know. And now uh, coming into the, the short term measures that can be done. Um, just over to the right here in the blue, there are some insecticides um, that have been approved, but these are a limited approval. Uh, so golf courses, race courses, polo fields, we, we don't have many of them at least, uh, not, not around me, uh, and things like airfields, so high value um, grassland. Um, some of the biological control, I'll come on to a bit later. There's other techniques such as rolling, um, which has been suggested during the summer. So this is when the, 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 the leather jackets pupate and they come quite close to the surface. And if you put a heavy roller over, then this can, can crush the pupae um, before they emerge. Now, speaking to the farmers in Fermanagh, they said that was probably a no-go for them. Um, it, it just wouldn't work in terms of their uh, particular situations. Um, one of this, I'll just come on to, to talk about grazing. So, um, yeah, just to, to go into a bit more detail about this, um, short term measures, uh, biopesticides and insecticides. So uh, nematodes are used for control in garden lawns, uh, but the cost of these would just be prohibited. Um, so the costs may come down uh, as, you know, the, 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 the sort of bulked up, but at the moment it's just too expensive. Just, just to give you some background information, these, these are a little nematodes, tiny minute worms. And what they do is they burrow in through the, the breathing tubes uh, and the mouth of, of the leather jackets. And then they release a symbiotic bacteria. And it's actually a bacteria that uh, kills the insect larva. And then the leather jackets just feed, uh, sorry, the, the nematodes just feed on the cadaver uh, that's left. Now, this is this is not a leather jacket here. This is probably a, a, a wax moss. But you can see the number of, of nematodes that are emerging. So they can be a very effective biological control agents. They're just too expensive. 